So I know I finished my last video by absolutely slamming the American remake of Pascal Logier's Martyrs, but today I turn over a new leaf. Instead, I'm going to be arguing in favor of remakes, because believe it or not, I do think there are some positives. Remake fatigue is rife. It feels like familiar titles are everywhere and new versions of established favourites are being announced constantly. The resounding response from cinema lovers and average theatre goers alike is that we're sick of remakes, although box office numbers haven't done the best job proving it. Wonka, the little mermaid. There are some distinctions between remakes, reimaginings, reboots, requels, prequels, and adaptations. Although they can be muddy, I've done my best to surmise Wikipedia and this Vox article into the most simple definitions so we can all be on the same page. So, a remake is a newer version of a pre-existing property in the same medium mostly film. A reimagining is often used to tell a derivative story, perhaps focusing on a different character, or setting the story in a new time period. Basically remakes with a much wider berth. A reboot is pretty much a remake, but is often distinct in beginning a new timeline that either erases or coincides with the original continuity. For instance, the Scream reboot gives us a new story with elements from the original existing in the same timeline, whereas the Hellraiser reboot is a potential new beginning to the entire franchise, unconnected to the original film. An adaptation transforms a piece of media across mediums. So you might start with a book, and it can have a film, a stage play, and a TV adaptation as with Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House. Or think Mean Girls and Mean Girls the Musical the Movie, a full circle of adaptation. And then stop thinking about Mean Girls the Movie the Musical and hope you never have to think about it again. But no matter what box you cram a piece of intellectual property into, it's incredibly difficult to package it as something brand new. Brand. Brand new. We crave original stories, new worlds, new life, but the remakes keep coming. And horror has fallen victim to this trend almost more than any other genre, with its main rival being kids' films thanks to The Mouse House. And while complaining is fun, I can't deny that there are plenty of horror remakes I personally love. Which has me wondering, is the hate for remakes really deserved? Maybe remakes are good, actually. So, what got me thinking about all of this in the first place? You already know, you have seen the subheading. You already know! The early 2000s saw an abundance of horror remakes. House of Wax, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Omen, The Ring, The Amityville Horror, The Hills Have Eyes. And we did these films so dirty. And sure, not all of them were good. I have seen Nicolas Cage's The Wicker Man and that one probably deserves some of the hostility. But across the board, this wave of horror remakes was met with incredibly negative reviews. The films were often criticized for being tacky, tasteless, unoriginal, poorly acted, and overly indulgent in jump scares and violence compared to the originals. The Obama hands are really in their like full glory today. Spider-Man, Spider-Man reference. So yeah, people really hated these movies, critics and elitist audiences alike. But I come at these movies from a different perspective, because up until I was 22, I was absolutely terrified of horror films, so I hadn't watched any of them, all the films that they were based on, until recently. When I finally did get round to it, whether I watched the remake or the original first, I didn't have a strong attachment to either. And without the killer of comparison or the confirmation bias of their faults from other viewers, I've really enjoyed these horror remakes. While I can acknowledge that the acting isn't always a strong suit, although we owe Paris Hilton an apology for The House of Wax, she was amazing in that film, and I feel like if that had been in Palo Alto or Lady Bird, people would have been like, oh my god, Paris Hilton can really act. Um, the culture is broken. I adore the grimy, tacky, over-the-top quality of these films, and I truly think that remake bias, not poor filmmaking, was responsible for the poor reception. We're now in a new era of remakes, one that I feel a little less sure of, but I'm willing to question my own attitude towards it. To get to the bottom of where the current bias begins, let's start by looking at why remakes are made.
why are we still making remakes? The most obvious reason is no secret money. Big corporations and production companies love to guzzle the dollars of the working class to fund their yacht trips. And producing a repeat of a popular property that banks on recognition and nostalgia is an easy way to get asses in seats. When it comes to the early 2000s era specifically, it could be claimed that these remakes came about due to the global financial recession, as film studios were seeking low effort, high return projects. As Darren Mooney writes for The Journal, making a horror film is pocket change when compared to the cost of Skyfall or The Dark Knight Rises. So the studios can afford to take a gamble on these films that can still turn a profit, even if they don't perform spectacularly. Horror also tends to invite in a very passionate audience, as I'm sure you all know. And many franchises find themselves with cult followings. While remakes are not linear additions, hardcore fans still have an interest in checking out every tale told within a world they already love or feel protective of. For those reasons, reproducing reliable classics from a profitable genre became the trend. Now, the second reason we often see remakes is to do with property rights. Spider-Man is a perfect example of this. Between 2002 and 2021, we had three different live-action Spider-Man trilogies because the rights to the immensely popular character have been bought and sold back and forth between Sony and Marvel for decades. The studios weren't going to waste any time in owning such lucrative IP, so with each switch, a new iteration of Spider-Man was instantly underway. Hi, editor's note. I feel like I may have oversimplified this for the sake of time. So this is a really excellent article that dives further into the case of Spider-Man's IP and specifically details the fact that as part of their contract, Sony does have to make a Spider-Man film every five years to retain the rights. Beyond those factors, there's also developing technology. The continuous development of animation and CGI, rigs and cameras and software that I can't even imagine, enables filmmakers to create a vast array of images and sounds never seen before. Look at all this space. Okay. These developments can allow for incredible advancements in believability and awe for an audience. The intention, in theory, is to improve upon the original and the possibilities are endless. But the boundless possibilities of new technology can be a hindrance too. When the focus strays from good storytelling and leans into spectacle for the sake of spectacle. Damn button! Damn button! It was so much easier to cough Elizabeth Banks' name. Elizabeth Banks. It almost makes the outcome worse when new technology is the only reason a film is remade and it still sucks. Think Disney's The Lion King. They remade it with lifelike lions, an incredible achievement, but did it make the film better? No. In fact, it took away so much of the character's ability to emote, something that gives the cartoon so much life. All of that being said, sometimes the reason behind a remake isn't connected to studio decisions or technological advancements. Sometimes it comes down to an individual director's desire, and I think remakes tend to be better received when a director is truly making something their own. Luca Guadagnino's Suspiria, which I talk about at length in this video, is an incredible movie and a remake. Dario Gento's 1977 Suspiria is a neon, blood-soaked giallo with a minimal plot. Guadagnino's 2018 remake is a bleak, pensive film set during the Cold War, and it expands massively on seemingly irrelevant, but actually incredibly important parts of the story. Guadagnino referred to his version as an homage, which perhaps is just a wanky way of saying reboot or reimagining, but he really used Argento's baseline story to say something and to say something new. Even in cases where the resulting remake isn't that strong, despite a director's vision, it can't be written off as just a copy or cheap imitation if at bare minimum they're trying to do something different. The multiple versions of The Thing are an interesting example of the aforementioned reasons culminating, showing where they can both be a help and a hindrance. Two films, 1951's The Thing from Another World and 1982's The Thing, have been adapted from the novella Who Goes There. 
The 80s version came along because Universal had the rights and wanted to remake it. After making Halloween, director John Carpenter was brought on board thanks to producer and old friend Stuart Cohen. Interestingly, Carpenter didn't want to be part of the remake as The Thing from Another World was one of his own favourite films and he didn't want to touch it. But after rereading the novella, he began to envision his own new adaptation. Unfortunately, the studio flopped on the thing three times, much to Carpenter's chagrin, but eventually it came to fruition after the triumphant reception of another sci-fi horror, Alien. I've only seen Carpenter's The Thing, but both adaptations are meant to be excellent films. However, I would make the bold claim that the 80s edition is the one that is solidified in audiences' minds, landing itself on almost every best horror films of all time listicle, this can be credited not just to Carpenter's vision, but to the incredible practical effects done by Rob Botin. Botin. Rob Botin. <laughs> effects that wouldn't have been achievable in the 50s when The Thing from Another World was made. It's one of the few examples of a remake, although technically an adaptation, exceeding the original. Proof that technical developments and the passion of the filmmakers can lead a remake to glory. Where this gets more interesting and takes a turn for the worse is with the 2011 film the Thing. It's technically a prequel to Carpenter's version, although easily mistaken as a remake on account of having the same name, which is a tactic that seems to be adopted a fair bit these days for some reason. According to this Screen Rant interview, it came about because directors Mark Abraham and Eric Newman were looking for something new to work on, and The Thing was already in Universal's catalogue. Both producers loved Carpenter's version, which is why they opted for a sequel, although one with vast similarities over a reboot. The Thing 2011 is not great. It's not terrible, but in my opinion, it's not really different enough to merit existing. One of the biggest differences, the use of CGI and digital effects, which pale in comparison to the original practical effects, is considered by many to be its greatest flaw. Sadly, using CGI to this degree wasn't director Mathis van Heiningen Jr.'s, oh my god, that's so hard to say, director Matisse van Heiningen Jr.'s intention. But supposedly, many of the practical effects were scrapped as Universal was concerned the film would look outdated. The 2011 film was even shot with the practical mechanics and models and placed with CGI after the fact. As my video on Labyrinth indicates, I am a lover of practical effects and puppetry, desperate for cinema to re-enter a wave of Jim Henson-esque magic. And I'm sure many horror fans can attest to this preference, which makes the studio's decision seem remarkably out of touch. In 2020, Universal and Blumhouse announced a remake of Carpenter's The Thing. And in instances like this, I can safely say, we're done. We don't need four versions of The Thing. But without remakes, we wouldn't have had perhaps the best iteration of Who Goes There and possibly one of the best sci-fi horrors of all time at all. Thinking back to the early 2000s films, they've retained a lasting reputation for being trashy, tacky and cheap, epitomizing American horror of the era along with non-remakes like Wrong Turn, Final Destination, Dead Silence, Saw and Hostel, but without the added downfall of comparison. As I said earlier, comparison is a killer, the real villain of this story. Ooh. It's an easy way to dismiss something without acknowledging any of its value. We stop looking at the specific qualities of a movie and boil everything down to better or worse. Forgetting the difference doesn't mean the end products have to be diametrically opposed. But outside of the medium of film, comparison isn't a dirty word. In fact, it's something that can be mined for positivity when evaluating intellectual property. In theatre, we see the same stories right down to the script, staging and music told over and over again with new casts and visuals and directors. These revivals are celebrated. They allow for transformation of meaning and intent. They allow us to see many incredible performers in the same iconic roles. Revivals let a director's ability and nuances truly shine within the same material as another. In some ways, every iteration of a stage play or a musical is a remake but it isn't frowned upon on that basis alone. And sure, while remakes and reboots can change a lot, theatre revivals tend to at least be grounded by a singular script. 
Which might be a plus for some people, as you're getting the words that you know and love, a la Shakespeare. But I'd argue this level of familiarity isn't favoured in film. Shot for shot remakes like The Omen and Psycho seem to particularly rub people the wrong way. But for the above reasons, I see them as fully comparable to stage productions that have retained the same script and staging. I love the 2006 Omen remake, but it has terrible reviews. The number one thing I see people complaining about is that it's shot for shot and unoriginal. But there's not that much else to say about it because it's not actually bad. Seeing the similarities to theatre has allowed me to see the value in a lot of remakes because I no longer see them as imitations of an original, but as a new package in which a beloved story is available to me. We've moved to a chair because I am actually that lazy. I also think it's important to consider how a piece of cinema places itself, as often we can slap the remake label on something without being fully informed, which leads to needless criticism. These flies. People are calling Mean Girls 2024 a remake of the 2004 film, but actually Mean Girls 2024 is a film version of the stage musical that was in itself adapted from the 2004 film which I know sounds insane, but go with me on this. But the internet is aflame with people begging the question, why has Mean Girls been remade? But it could be argued, and it is being by many fans, that Mean Girls hasn't been remade. Mean Girls the musical has been made. And in this sense, I think we owe adaptations and reimaginings a little more grace before assuming they're just senseless copies. In saying that though, because I cannot escape a caveat to save my life, the leniency given to something claiming it isn't a remake, it's a reboot, a reimagining, a requel, a new adaptation, is not always deserved. Those labels can feel like a feeble attempt to align themselves with something deemed more creatively valuable than just another remake. So it's definitely a case-by-case -case situation. And I will be honest on my own hypocrisy here because I rolled my eyes about 20 times watching the Mean Girls trailer, but I'm only human. So do we need to retain this vitriol? Do we even hate remakes as much as we think we do? Robert Eggers' Nosferatu is on the way. And as far as I can tell, we're all frothing at the mouth for it. The original Nosferatu is a hundred years old, having been made in 1922. There's a lot to be said in the way of detachment from the original and eagerness for accessibility in remaking a film that is so, so much older. Eggers has also proven his talent with his original films, so perhaps this shows that people are more willing to see what he can do with an existing property. Similar to Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, which I actually hated. Although, a director is not a surefire guarantee of a warm reception. The American remake of The Grudge has the same director as the far more well-received original Japanese film. So why does everyone think the remake is so average? I definitely have my theories, which I talk about in this video if you're interested to know more about Japanese horror. But all in all, I think the heart of it is not that we hate remakes. It's that we hate the reason they're so often made to make money off of us. Audiences want to feel like cinema is serving them on an emotional level for entertainment, for intellectual stimulation. They don't want to feel used or tricked or on one side of an obvious cash grab, tired of nostalgia being used to manipulate. And so many of us will sit through something like Disney's Little Mermaid sighing at every turn because we know why it was made, whether or not it was good. There's a reward in watching original horror cinema like Talk To Me or When Evil Lurks because you know that what's in front of you was a gamble, not a certain exchange in which a production company ends up with millions in pocket. I don't think the money side of cinema is all insidious though. God, imagine a world where we only had insidious movies. <laughs> A big movie that makes a lot of money can bring in the funds to support a plethora of smaller projects that otherwise wouldn't be made. Likewise, as audiences, we need to put our money where our mouths are. It's complicated at best. 
But remakes have given us some amazing films like The Fly, The Thing, Suspiria, and some films deemed bad that I would urge you to retry. And yes, I am generally sick of remakes like everybody else, and sick of studios looking for the easy options rather than taking risks on original films. But who knows, maybe right now we're unable to see the current wave of remakes, reboots, and re-adaptations for their own merits. And maybe this is something we should be a little more open to. But if they fuck up Fern Gully, there will be hell to pay. Thank you as always for watching. It is a blessing to have people on my channel. Matewa, and see you in the next one.